One, two, three, four, five. Yes, we're on. Good. Good evening. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the VK3 EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Narry Warren South. Very pleasant good evening to everybody on frequency tonight <clears throat> on this uh, 19th of April on a, uh, a chillyish sort of a night and uh, the current footy game is uh, neck and neck which is good and of course I'm hoping Eston will win I've been slightly distracted uh, with the footy there running over there at the, uh, on the TV anyway pleasant good evening and trust everybody is okay our prime frequency tonight is 3541 kilohertz 3541 kilohertz in the 80 meter amateur radio band and uh, also um, uh, transmitting via VK3 RTV digital channel 1 Melbourne Television Repeater in full HD and uh, also streaming on YouTube, my YouTube channel. Just type in VK3CSJ in the YouTube search engine and uh, you'll be able to find uh, the, my station. And uh, just look for the live indication and click on that and hopefully uh, my YouTube uh, stream will hold out, won't fall over or anything like that. Uh, now, I trust everything is is all okay. Um, very, very rushed just in the last 20 minutes getting program material. We've got a, a report from Timotha Scove tonight. It's, she's uh, She put forth a, uh, a solar report about four days ago, so uh, we'll run with that. Um, also, uh, I we also have an email address, vk 3 uh, ekh at gmail.com vk3 ekh at gmail.com for any signal reports i'm not sure why my discord uh, uh isn't working i've got a, a, a gray screen on discord so i can't view any discord chat at the moment um but uh, <laughs> for some reason it's just a gray screen so uh, i closed it and, and opened it again it's uh, still a gray screen so i'm not sure uh, what's going on there anyway um looks like um uh, looks like uh, I've already got an email there from uh, from Wayne and Stephen. <laughs> Thanks, chaps. That was pretty quick off the mark. So I'm, I'm glad to uh, to see uh, that you're out there. Um, let me just make sure that uh, there's no particular thing message there. Uh, audio is spot on. No stream or ATV submissions in this report. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anything? Only message seems just a little quieter. Okay, all right. And Steve says that uh, 25 in bearing up, great signal, and maybe a little less strong. Maybe a little less strong today. Well, um, I'm trying to be a little bit conservative on the power side of it, just so the uh, modem doesn't go tripping over. Um, let me see where I am on uh, that scale. On that scale, just checking one, two, three, four. Oh, yeah, it could be a bit less. Um, one, two, three, hang on, let me just uh, check my levels here. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. How's that? And uh, making sure my audio level doesn't clip because uh, I did notice that uh, YouTube last week was shocking. I, I Again, I apologize for uh, the distorted uh, aspect to uh, YouTube, um, but I think I've got that right tonight. I'm not. Uh, I'm just going. I'm. I'm looking at my VMix uh, level, and it's just clipping into the red, whereas uh, normally I'd be uh, flat out on that. <laughs> so I think I'm pretty right on YouTube. Somebody can uh, give us a report on YouTube. That'd be uh, appreciative. Uh, it's going to be a quick session tonight. <laughs> I say that every Friday, don't I? Um, but. Um, yeah, like I say, I, I was distracted by the footy game, and there was something else I was trying to find. There was, um, I couldn't remember, it was on Facebook, but I, I couldn't remember who published it. Um, there's a, a place, uh, a home in Florida, uh, that was um, had a, a bit of debris fall through their roof. Uh, and uh, the the debris was a chunk of uh, rubbish from uh, the International Space Station. 
they uh, they threw out something <laughs> to burn up in in the atmosphere and um, it was interesting to read because uh, NASA's uh, pretty uh, um, right across what they they decide to uh, throw overboard on the International Space Station with the intention that it will burn up in the atmosphere and apparently there's a whole lot of calculations and mathematics and science behind uh, leaving uh, uh, throwing stuff uh, out of the this, the International Space Station and you know ie they they know that it's going to burn up that the, the, the information that they have is that, yes, we can throw that out safely and it will completely burn up in the atmosphere. Well, uh, it, as it turns out, uh, this bit of junk didn't uh, completely burn up. And it's a, it was a solid bit of metal, actually. Uh, but you could actually see where it had been uh, burnt by the atmosphere, by friction in the atmosphere. And... Um, uh, and of course, uh, we didn't see the damage to the person's house, but it went through their roof. And uh, <laughs> uh, I think there's uh, there's some sort of negotiations going on at the moment to try and uh, get there or get NASA to repair the damage to the roof. But NASA was particularly interested in the uh, piece of material that um, didn't burn up, and uh, they they're going to reinvestigate to their uh, calculations to. Uh, to uh, work out why this didn't exactly burn up uh, in in re-entry, so uh, I I read that and I saw the picture of this piece of metal and I I it's uh, it's gone it's lost, so I, I tried to to look for it but uh, I, I I don't know where it was. It's not on my usual uh, uh, astronomy news sources here tonight. I I couldn't find it in in the rush. That, uh, that I had. Um, okay, there's an email that's just come through from uh, Mr. Lewis, and he says, listening YouTube, oh, I tell you, my eyes aren't very good these days. Uh, what, what are you saying? Um, good signal on 80 once again. Yeah, that, that's okay, I know that. Um, what are you saying though about YouTube? Audio is okay this evening. Oh, good, okay, thank you. That, that's from Mr. Lewis, VK3 Golf Lima. Alrighty then. Um, so yeah, um, unfortunately I couldn't uh, couldn't locate that information. But if I can find it for next week, I shall do that. Uh, the Astronomical Society of Victoria, founded in 1922, comprises well over 1,600 members throughout Victoria and overseas. Membership of the society is open to all persons with an interest in astronomy. The society's objectives are to encourage the study and practice of astronomy and to disseminate the knowledge of the science and to provide greater facilities for the study among its members. Monthly meetings are usually held on the second Wednesday of each month, except in January. Uh, where, the, where it's normally held on a Saturday. Monthly meetings are usually held on a second Wednesday of each month. Yes, I've just said that. Meetings start at 8pm at the Mulia Hall, Burwood Avenue, Melbourne, near the Melbourne Observatory, which is located not too far from the Shrine of Remembrance. Uh, parking is available in Burwood Avenue, Dallas Brooks Drive and surrounding streets. Admission is free and visitors are most welcome. The monthly meetings kick off at 8 o'clock and usually aim to finish at 10 o'clock. Uh, they are now streamed on YouTube, uh, ASV's dedicated YouTube channel. And um, uh, also on Facebook, ASV has quite a, a dominance on Facebook. Page. There's quite a few pages there, but you have to be a member to get access to some of them. Uh, privileges of membership include the right to borrow books, periodicals and other publications from the Society's extensive library, uh, which is located at the Melbourne Observatory. Receipt of the ASV's magazine Crux, containing articles, observing notes and the like. And the free provision of the Astronomical Yearbook. Access is available to telescopes on members' nights held regularly at the Melbourne Observatory and after the monthly meetings with the permitting. There are instruments there located at the site and uh, the Society's 300mm equatorial reflector and also a 300mm portable reflector are there. There's also a 200mm refractor which is managed by the Royal Botanic Garden and uh, a photoheliograph are also housed at the observatory and are accessible as well. The society also has a number of 200mm reflectors available for short period loan in the ASV's tele uh, telephone, telephone telescope loan scheme. Uh, and members are also encouraged to make use of the society's country property located near Heathcote, some 90 minute drive north of Melbourne. 
there are a range of instruments available for members to use, larger, the larger two only with appropriate training, which range from 300mm to 1000mm in aperture. Also located on the side is an 8.5 steerable radio telescope, which members can access with involvement in the radio astronomy section. Members are encouraged to make and use telescopes. Advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same. Instrument making, of course, is only just one of the uh, uh, sections that are available for members to get involved with. And um, in alphabetical order, you've got the astrophotography section, the club section, comet and meteor section, computing section, cosmology and astrophysics, deep sky, historical section. Each time I say that, historical section, I immediately think of uh, a, a group of people all breaking out in laughter. Um, instrument making, juniors, lunar and planetary, new astronomers group, radio astronomy, solar astronomy, space exploration and women in the ASV. I was about to say women in space. Women in the ASV which is a, uh, a new section. Um, let's see, yes, um, just quickly see what they say here. Uh, the purpose of this group is to assist women who join the ASV to connect with each, o each other and women who are interested in and particip to participate, participate in astronomy. It is an excellent way for women to help each other, share their knowledge of, and ideas and voice any concerns or issues that might have in a safe environment. It is also a good way for women to, who might not feel comfortable attending section meetings, events uh, or LMDSS by themselves to find out which other uh, ladies might be attending. So uh, yes, the uh, if uh, you're a lady interested in astronomy, um, by all means, go and check the the, the uh, women in the ASV section, which is uh, relatively new. Um, I think it's been kicked off just uh, sometime last year. So it's a quite a, a good initiative. Um, all right. Uh, so, yes, so if, if any of those uh, sections are of interest to you or you'd like to pop in for a visit, um, uh, that you can op go to the sections tab on the ASV website and each section that I just read out there has its own individual page and also its uh, contact details for a section director. Uh, send them an email and uh, ask if you can uh, pop in on a Zoom meeting or, um, or actually come in on a meeting that might be being held somewhere and uh, I'm sure they'll invite you in as a guest to uh, to see if it, it's of interest to you. And of course the section director will then uh, talk to you about um, what's involved in becoming a member. Uh, so you get uh, all that. That is to say also that there is a um, uh, membership can be found on the homepage as well under the membership tab. And it's all done via PayPal now too. So very good. Uh, excellent. Hey, um Okay, I think that's about all I want to say on all that. Uh, you're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3, EKH. Oh, and the ASV website. Uh, you can find all the information at www.asv.org.au. www.asv.org.au. Alrighty then. Um, okay, now, I, like I said, I very, very quickly put things together tonight because I've been, been distracted by the footy. Um, and I'm, again, I'm being distracted because I'm looking at the TV over the side here. I'm just trying to see a score. I can't see a score from this angle because I've got so much crap on my table, I can't see the bottom of the screen. Usually they have the score running at the top corner, but they can't see it, so I don't know who's ahead right now. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, let's have another cup of coffee here. Being distracted well and truly. Yes, I don't know why my Discord's not working, so uh, I'll, I'll, um, look, you're all welcome to come up on Discord and have a, a chat, um, and say hello, and I'll, I'll try and suss it out, um, a little later, and, um, make a few comments then. Um, okay, this is uh, before we go into Timothy's report, because Timothy's report's about 17 minutes long, so it's nice and lengthy, and <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll cue her up uh, in just a short moment. Uh, the largest digital camera ever made for astronomy has been done. You would have thought that uh, that's, that's already been done. <laughs> this is published April 17. 
so it's pretty current courtesy of astronomy.com the the um the largest space telescope the ll the lsst camera is expected to re re uh, reveal new insights into our galaxy during its 10-year ultra-wide survey of the sky a digital camera the size of a sedan uh, was recently completed with the hopes of gleaning new information about dark energy, dark matter, the Milky Way, and of course more. The Legacy Survey of Space and Telescope, LSST, camera will be mounted on the Simnoi Survey Telescope at the Vera C. Rubin Observatory in Chile later this year. The new imager weighs 6,600 6, pounds or 3,000 kilograms and the lens is roughly the height of a small adult at 5 feet, 1.5 meters across. It has 3,200 megapixels compared to about 48 uh, megapixels for a digital camera on the market today. According to a news release from National Science Foundation, uh, Nori Lab, the field of view is so foundation Nori that is say so science foundation Nori Lab, comma, the field of view is so large that it would take hundreds of high definition televisions to display one image at full size. I've got a picture of it here. I'll I'll just bring this up while I'm chatting away. Um, and I did hide it. Here it is. Here's this camera that we're talking about. Um, just checking there and uh, where is the article so um, it images its images are so detailed that it could resolve a golf ball from around 25 kilometers away while covering a swath of sky seven times wider than the full moon said Ruben observatory deputy director and camera program lead Aaron uh, Rudman R double O D M A N Rud Rudman. <laughs> Over a ten year period, the camera is expected to map an array of night sky objects. This includes looking for weak gravitational lensing, a phenomenon experienced when galaxies bend the light of objects behind them. This will help astronomers establish how mass how mass is distributed across the universe. The camera will also look at clusters of dark matter and dark energy, supernovae, and focus on objects uh, within our own solar system, such as asteroids, full stop. With the LSST camera at its core, Rubin Observatory will delve deeper than ever before into the cosmos and help answer some of the hardest, most important questions in physics today said Kathy Turner, Program Manager of the Department of Energy's Cosmic Frontier Program. The incredibly thin lenses and camera is currently being tested at the Department of Energy's SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory in Menlo Park, California. However, uh, what was that? Oh, yeah. However, it will soon be shipped from the SLAC facility to the Cerro Pachon in the Andes Mountains in Chile. Uh, there it will be mounted on the Simnoi telescope later this year and will possibly begin ob observa operations uh, in 2025. So, uh, the largest digital camera ever made for astronomy. And... Um, they're saying that it's, uh, it weigh, it comes in at 3,000 kilograms. Uh, its uh, lens is roughly the height of 1.5 metres across. And uh, it has 3,200 megapixels compared to about 48 megapixels for a digital camera on the market today. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what comes from that uh, telescope in the next uh, couple of years or so. Most interesting indeed, where they spend the money. All right, you're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, and the time is 10.20. And just, just give me a second or two. 
Seventy-four, seventy-eight. Oh, yeah. oh. Just uh, checking the scores. Essendon's ahead. <laughs> now, um, next we have. Next we have. Oh, Struth. Uh, Jupiter. Something about Jupiter. I think my glasses isn't it cleaning. Jupiter Violet Moon Io has been the solar system's most volcanic body for around 4.5 billion years. This is published 23 hours ago, courtesy of space.com. Io is an amazing moon, and uh, I have a picture of Io. If you've never seen Io before, this is what it looks like close up. Um, um, if I can find it, didn't I move that across? Didn't move it across. All right, just a sec. Um, I'm pretty sure that I did save the image, and it should be just here somewhere. There it is. I don't, just didn't bring it across. Always doing silly little things like that. Here's Io. Eo. Io. I say Io, and I think Latin. It's meant to be Eo. Um, so there it is. Look at that magnificent moon. You'll see it on my YouTube channel if you don't have access to VK3R TV. Actually, we might be streaming on the BATC feed tonight too. I didn't check that. Uh, there is some sort of um, indication that uh, the British amateur television stream might be uh, might be working again. Um, okay, back to the article. Uh, Io. Uh, represented a big mystery because its surface doesn't hold a record of its history uh, the way the surfaces of less active moons do. Uh, the solar system's most volcanic body, the moon of Jupiter Io, has been uh, in turmoil for at least 4.57 billion years, right back to its birth and infancy uh, of, th of the Sun. Those are the findings of a team of scientists who examined Io with the Akakama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, or ALMA, to track sulfur and chlorine in the Jovian moon's atmosphere. Scientists have understood that the gravitational tug of war between Jupiter and the neighbouring Jovian moons, Europa and Ganymede, generates immense tidal forces within Io that causes its intense volcanism. What wasn't clear until now was just how long the influence of Jupiter and its moons had been wreak wreaking havoc on Io. That's because the constant flow of lava from its extreme volcanism across its surface keeps the moon looking fresh. Io's surface is very young, meaning that the lava flows and volcanic plume deposits cover up any features that are more than around one million years old. Catherine de Cleur, team leader and assistant professor of planetary science and astronomy at Caltech, told Space.com. Therefore, it has not previously been possible to learn anything about Io's volcanic history beyond the past million years, which is very recent from a geological perspective. Io represented, represented a big mystery because its surface doesn't hold a record of its history the way the surfaces of less active moons do. Io's atmosphere can't hide the age of its volcanism, however. And actually, there's another image here I'll bring up uh, right at it about now. Uh, there it is. And this particular image uh, is a multiple fractal filters layers show Io rendered in psychedelic colors. A little bit of artistic uh, license there, I think. The extreme... <clears throat> Volcanism of Io depends on the precise arrangement of three moons and the rhythmic, rhythmic, rhythmic gravitational dance in which they orbit Jupiter. Io is in an orbital resonance with Europa and Ganymede, meaning that their orbital periods are integral multiples of one another. 
Declare said, for every four orbits of Io, there are exactly two orbits of Europa and one orbit of Ganymede. That means that the moon's gravitational effects on one other, one another are at the same place every orbit, tweaking the orbits from circles into eclipses. She added that once these moons are in eclipses, their distances from Jupiter changes as they go around, so they experience changing gravity from Jupiter. The changing amount of gra- uh, the, the changing amount of Jupiter's gravity felt by Io results in rock tides on the moon, and Io's shape is compressed and stretched out every orbit, which is only 1.8 days. This generates friction in its mantle, which produces enough heat to melt rock. The gravitational push and pull of Jupiter, Europa and Ganymede on Io generate tidal forces so intense that they can cause the surface of the moon to rise and fall by heights as greater as 100 metres. This is equivalent to the surface of Earth in New York, the, of Earth in New York suddenly jumping up above the top of the Statue of Liberty. The big question is: Has this been happening for a long, for as long as these moons have been in existence? Computer simulations published over the past 20 years have shown that Io, Europa and Ganymede could have been captured into their current resident orbital configuration right as they are forming, Declare continued. This resonance is what ultimately causes the volcanism. Therefore, it makes sense that if the moons were in this configuration from the time of their formation, Io would have been volcanic from or for that same amount of period. And there's another image here in this article. Uh, bring it up. Okay. And in this image, uh, Juno, uh, which is a probe orbiting Jupiter, Juno observed Jupiter's moon Io in visible and infrared light during May 1, 2023 flyby, yielding this comp- composite view showing hotspots across the surface of the solar system's most volcanically active world. So in that one, there's actually a couple of images there, but in all those those two images, there are uh, uh, hotspots captured by uh, Juno. Um So, with scientists unable to glean information about how long Io has been highly volcanic, Declare and colleagues used ELMA, an array of 66 radio antennas in the Akatama Desert of northern Chile, Akakama Desert of northern Chile, to hunt for clues in its thin atmosphere. In particular, they looked for stable isotopic radios of sulfur and chlorine bearing molecules. The team found that both elements are more present in heavy isotopic variants. Atoms with higher numbers of neutrinos neutrinos nutri, neutrons neutrons that's it neutrons compared to the average value found across the solar system that occurs at results of lighter uh, isotopes from the other world's upper atmospheres. On Io, volcanism causes the material to be continuously recycled between the moon's interior and its atmosphere, and Declare and crew found, as a result of this, the Jovian moon has lost as much as 94% to 96% of its lighter sulphur isotopes. This is something that would have only been possible in the face of billions of years of volcanism going right back to the birth of Io. We used sulfur isotopes in an Io's in Io's atmosphere to deduce that Io has been producing sulfur-rich gas, and therefore uh, that is has been volcanically active for billions of years. This is a nice conf- confirmation of some prior predictions that have been made. She says. For Declare, the results represent long-term fascination with Io. Pro- provo- um, providing answers to nagging questions. 
I have been fascinated, she says, by the question of IO's long-term evolution for as long as I have studied IO, she says. I'm interested not just in how planets and moons are today, but how they got to be that way and the way they are. And the Caltech professor isn't done with IO yet. After answering questions about Jovian's moon's very fiery nature, she wants to know if it ever had a core aspect and if it was destroyed by its volcanism. As for what is next, she says, I'd love to know whether I once had a water ocean and ice crust, as its neighbours Europa and Ganymede do, and uh, that was subsequently lost by volcanism uh, or some other means, She's uh, she concluded. So that was courtesy of space.com. All right. Yes, Io is a very interesting moon and uh, most photogenic. <laughs> um, but um, uh, it's also uh, its uh, relationship to Jupiter and its uh, sulfur that gets uh, um, emitted into space uh, produces these amazing... Uh, um, Tauruses of, uh, of, of, of of high current that uh, produce cyclotron uh, radiation, and it's the spiral of electrons in the cyclotron radiation that produces uh, uh, radio frequency energy uh, at uh, decametric frequencies, and IE um, or IO, <laughs> IE uh, storm activities, which can be de detected on uh, on Earth with a, yeah, a reasonable receiver and antenna. Anyway, that's another story. Uh, you're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, and with the regular Friday night broadcast. Uh, Venus is leaking carbon and oxygen, and we don't know why. Published 19th, 19th of April. Courtesy of Science Alert. Planetary atmospheres are typically typically leaking things. Uh, think about it. With no impenetrable barrier to hold it back against the void, some of it is bound to seep away and dissipate into the very tenuous medium in between parts of space. Earth loses about 90 tonnes of atmosphere material every day. It's interesting these little facts that you hear. Don't, you, know, you don't learn in science school. Earth loses about 90 tonnes of atmospheric material every day. That's not enough to make a dent, but it does give us a few clues about why some of the other planets are the way they are. Venus, for example, is thought to have once been a temperate world like Earth, with liquid water on its surface. Now, its scorching hell planet choked in clouds of carbon dioxide and rain sulfuric acid. Now, a spacecraft whipping past Earth's evil twin has detected atoms of carbon and oxygen leaking from Venus. In a discovery that, that when combined with previous findings on the losses of hydrogen, could yield clues uh, as to the planet's startling transformation. And, of course, we have a picture of Jupiter here, uh, sorry, Venus. So let's bring that up. So you're not always looking at me. Um, now a spacecraft startling transformation characterizing the losses of heavy ions and understanding the escape mechanisms at Venus is crucial to understand how the planet's atmosphere has evolved and how it has lost all its water in spite of being able in spite of being our nearest orbital, or, orbital neighbor and the most similar planet to Earth in the solar system, there's not much in situ f information about Venus, uh, full stop. There is just one dedicated mission studying Venus up close at the moment, and that is the Akatsuki Orbiter, which has been studying Venus's atmosphere since 2010. But spacecraft on the other missions are getting glimpses of Venus as they go about their other businesses. Beppe Colombo 
is a joint commission between the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency and the European Space Agency to study Mercury. The course of its mission included two close flybys of Venus, one in 2020 and the other in 2021, the second of which taking, of which taking the probe into a part of Venus's magnetic environment that hasn't been explored before. And there's another graphic here. I shall bring up this graphic. And there's a graphic. So, um, so what you're seeing on the screen at the moment is the diagram of Bepi Colombo's flight through the, the Venusian atmosphere sheath, magnetosphere sheath, magneto sheath. Now Venus doesn't have a magnetic field. Uh, that generated inside the planet like Earth does. Rather, its magnetic field is the result of a series of interactions between charged particles in Venus's upper atmosphere and magnetic fields and moving ions in the solar winds. Isn't that interesting? The result is a weak sphere of magnetism that forms a sort of teardrop shape with a tail streaming away with the solar wind. Draped around, draped around the magnetosphere is the magnetosheath between the outer boundary and the magnetosphere and compressed material called the bow shock. This is what Bepi Colombo flew through between Venus and the Sun, almost skimming the planet, and its instruments detected oxygen and carbon somehow accelerated sufficiently to escape Venus's gravity. This is the most this is the first time that positively charged carbon ions have been observed escaping from Venus's atmosphere. These are heavy ions that are usually slow moving, so we are still trying to understand the mechanism that they are that, that are at play. It may be that electrostatic wind is lifting them away from the planet, or they could be accelerated through some centrifugal processes. At least three missions are in the works to study Venus in the near future, which will hopefully shed light on many remaining questions. And these include the escape mechanism of carbon, whether the planet is still vol uh, volcanically active, and the burning question about whether life could be lurking among its clouds. And of course, how it evolved from a world that may have been once so similar to our own home planet. Recent results suggest that the atmospheric escape from Venus cannot fully explain the loss of its historical water content. This study is an important step to, un to uncover the truth about the historical evolution of the Venetian atmosphere and the upcoming missions to help fill in many gaps. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast. All right. No, didn't get there. Okay. A little bit of a, a plug for Astrophys podcast. Um, Brendan O'Brien hosts an exceptional astronomy podcast with two big episodes each month. On the 15th of each month, we interview leading astrophysicists and related experts from all over the world about astrophysics, astrophotography, space science, and big data, astro AI, and particle physics. Um, he's now got a new podcast released. It's called Astrophys 190, episode 190. Almost getting to 200 there, Brennan. Uh, it's uh, um, Professor Katie, how do you pronounce her surname? Achetel, Ch Achetel. <laughs> Professor Katie Achetel, A U C H E W T L, was it I? Achetai. The ex and her um, her uh, interest is the extreme death of stars. So that was released on the fifteenth of April. Uh, early this week so get along to astrophys.com and tune in to episode 190 of uh, of um, Brendan's uh, podcast the extreme death of stars 
I don't know where you find these uh, amazing ladies in, in science, uh, Brennan, but uh, it just goes to show there's uh, plenty out there. Uh, and Mount Burnett Observatory, um, up there in the hills. If uh, you want to find out more about uh, Mount Burnett Observatory, just uh, go to the website, of course. Uh, just type in Mount Burnett Observatory, and um, uh, well, the uh, URL is just simply mbo.org.au. mbo, Mount Burnett Observatory, mbo.org.au. There's um, a public night at the observatory on May the 4th at 7.30 p.m. Um, it looks like you have to pay an entry fee. I, I don't know about that. But uh, anyway, I, I see there's some sort of a, a, a cost figure there. It, it's, if, you, if you're keen to uh, pop along to the uh, observatory, just contact uh, the observatory. There'll be a, an, an email address somewhere there that you can contact and find out about uh, whether you can get along to uh, the public night observatory. But anyway, just visit the website for more information. And at 19 minutes to the hour, um, I think that's about all I've done. I've collected here. So we spoke about, what did we speak about? The largest digital camera ever made. Uh, Io's Jupiter, Venus, and, and that's it. Oh, my God, I thought I had more articles collected. Oh, there it goes. I was being distracted. Um, all right, let's now queue up. Timotha and uh, give her a bit of a talk uh, there's a nice little card captioned here that I like there it is and I shall bring Timotha up on screen 17 minutes this one goes for so she's got a lot to say so <laughs> um, let's just hope that I can get this done without too many problems Okay, this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. Here's Timothy Scobe with the latest space weather report. Stand by. We have a one-two punch for some Earth-directed solar storms, some big flare players return, and that total solar eclipse we had recently, well, it had a surprise. Those stories and more in the news this week. <laughs> If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to Millersville edu slash swen it's weather for the 21st century this forecast also sponsored in part by cw ops space weather this week picks up in a big way but first take a look at our sun this is what the sun looked like on april 8th during the total solar eclipse and in fact we had a couple big prominences here and here that featured well prominently during total totality. But there's something interesting about these prominences that you can't see unless you're looking from space. So we'll have to talk more about that surprise in a minute. Meanwhile, as we take a look at the rest of our solar disk, there hasn't been a lot of activity all that much. We kind of, whoops, Pate watched the moon go by. We kind of waited for the moon and the whole solar eclipse thing to go before activity really began to pick up. But we've had a few eruptions here in uh, the upper part of the sun. In fact, a couple of them, there's one right there, and then you'll see two filaments, one and two whoosh right there. Those, those little eruptions actually have sent an Earth-directed solar storm our way. In fact, when we take a look at coronagraphs, you can see a little bit of this kind of partial halo from stereos 
a uh, corona graph right there. But that is not a big storm. It's mostly going to go east of Earth, but it's got a little bit of a of a, a finger-like part that's going to actually hit Earth. Not going to expect all that much, but starting around the 14th. Then we're going to have, as you notice here, you'll see a big eruption begin, and then there'll be something right in this area as well. It's kind of like a bang-bang kind of thing. So whoosh right there, and then right here, whoosh right here. You see this? This one actually, as we take a look at corona graphs, you'll see a little bit of a halo. Look at that whoosh. See that right there? This is a halo as well. Once again, kind of wispy, but this one is much more Earth directed. So between those two eruptions, we actually do have two solar storms on their way to Earth. One should be hitting right around the uh, 14th, and then the other one could be hitting in the 15th. But we'll just have to see how, how quickly they arrive. But this could mean some decent shows for Aurora photographers. Meanwhile, look at all of the activity on the east limb. That big eruption that went off to the east, that is from old region 3614. Uh, that one has still yet to rotate into Earth view. But old region 3615 and 23 are rotating into Earth view. You can see them right here. They've been renumbered region 3637 and 36. 38, and you just saw a big solar flare from them. We're expecting to get a lot more radio blackouts from these regions over the course of this next week, and possibly Earth-directed solar storms. So Aurora photographers get ready, and amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, expect more uh, noise on the dayside radio bands. Now, switching to our M flare threat meter and dayside radio blackout meter, take a look at the X ray flux over this past week. You can see it right about the 10th really begin to climb. We started on the 11th popping some big solar flares. In fact, we had a big solar eruption there too, but we actually have been popping several big uh, M class flares. And so we're going to see more activity like this. Expect big radio blackouts on Earth's day side easily over this week and next week before things finally begin to settle down. Now, as we return to those two solar storms that were on their way to Earth, we switch to our solar storm prediction model, Enlil. Now, this is NOAA's version of the model. The top panel's density, the bottom panel's velocity. You're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. Now, as we set this solar storm model in motion, you can see that very first solar storm being launched to the east. It looks like it's mainly going to miss Earth, but there is this finger-like tail that's going to be actually tracking across Earth. So we're going to get a glancing blow from this solar storm. And then you can see the second solar storm being launched shortly thereafter. This is the one that's much more of a direct hit. This is the one that gave us that pretty halo in the Lasco uh, coronagraph imagery. Now, both of these solar storms, as they track out, it looks like the first one's going to hit Earth basically early on the 14th, maybe late on the 13th, but likely into the 14th because we have some really slow solar wind ahead of this solar storm. And then also, once that second solar storm begins and it hits, it looks like that's going to hit us about mid-afternoon on the 14th, but likely, again, it's probably going to be held up by traffic on the way, so don't be surprised if it hits us on the 15th, but that's the one-two punch, and that could definitely bring Aurora clear down to mid-latitudes, and so Aurora photographers, be sure to keep your batteries charged. And although we haven't had any solar storms as of late with gorgeous aurora, we did have a total solar eclipse that graced the skies over the entire North American continent. So we do have some gorgeous shots to share, including this one, which is a flight during totality. Can you imagine having a flight with a solar eclipse like this? Must have been such an incredibly surreal experience. And we had some gorgeous shots of the eclipse in Arkansas, including you can see even the, the prominences. And it was visible in Oklahoma. And we saw it in St. Louis with some Bailey beads. There's a triple Bailey beads. And you can see the, how strongly the prominences stood out. And it was seen again in Illinois. Again, Bailey beads and those prominences. That tells you how bright they were. And it was seen in Indianapolis, Indiana, and you can see once again some of the prominences. And it was seen in Vermont. Look at the prominences here, especially looking at the detail. And it was also seen in New Hampshire, the strong corona. Notice the big, bright region down here where that big prominence is. And there's the detail of the prominences. And then for some fun, here is Sugarloaf, Maine. 
where people were skiing under the totality. And I think GoPro even has a big movie of people skiing in totality. I don't know about you. I would absolutely wreck if that were me. And then even the prominences here were so incredibly bright. You can see this in Arkansas. This is a back of the camera shot. Not only are the prominences competing with the Bailey beads, but they're unbelievably bright even here. And that brings me back to the idea of what's going on exactly with these prominences. Where is the surprise? Well, in order to see that surprise, we have to pay closer attention to those solar prominences, and we need to compare space-based imagery with that of the solar eclipse from the ground. So as we put the two images side by side, this is from the space telescopes during totality, and this is obviously from the ground during totality, you can see the prominent structures are in a different location, both uh, in the space compared to on the ground, right? So how do we do this? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to make the sun, let's take a big picture of the sun, and look where those prominences are, right? We see them right here. Now let's overlay that uh, solar eclipse image. And so we'll pull that up here. And now you can see we've got the prominences from the solar eclipse, you can see them here, compared to the prominences on the space telescope imagery. And so we're going to need to actually uh, rotate the sun in order to kind of get that in the right location. So let's do that. Let's rotate that sun right there. Now we've got those prominences. You can see they're all lined up exactly the same way. Now on top of that, let's change the uh, imagery from the 304 angstroms to something that gives us a bit more view out further in the uh, chromosphere and in the corona. And as we light that up, you can see all the way around, the prominences are a little bit harder to see, but if you start seeing out here in the further part of the atmosphere, you start noticing an interesting feature. So let's let that take that eclipse image away to kind of make it a little bit clearer. So we're just looking at uh, space-based imagery from this point on. So then you can start really taking a really close look at what is this feature that seems to be stuck at the very tip of that prominence. And as we blow that image up, you can see what looks to be somewhat like a semicircle underneath that prominence, maybe even attached to it. And we'll blow that up even more. And as we blow it up really large, now you begin to see this kind of interesting hollowed out, very dark region here, much more dark than the surroundings, and it looks like it's actually tethered. And there are some people who have seen these structures in the past, and they think that this is an alien spaceship, like a big black sphere, and it's got a, a tube coming down here and it's refueling from the sun because it's using the plasma from the sun, sucking it right up into it. But what this actually is, is the magnetic core of a big solar storm that has yet to be launched. We call these flux rope structures, and the reason why is because they look very much like big coils, but they're made of magnetic field, and they hollow out this region, but that's why they're curved like this. And if you look closely, you can even see some of the magnetic field that's lit up in the solar atmosphere, looking almost as if it is kind of caging and helping to keep that big solar slinky tucked away before it actually erupts into a big solar storm. And the fact that you got to see one of these solar storms tethered to the top of a prominence during a total solar eclipse before the solar storm launched, well, that is a very neat surprise. So what else does our sun have in store for us this week? Well, we can no longer use Stereo A imagery to take a look at the sun's far side because Stereo A is staring at the same side of the sun that we are. So we have to simulate the far side by using SDO, AIA, and HMI imagery of about two weeks ago to get an idea of what might be lurking on the sun's far side. And as we take a look, Oh my goodness, there's a lot going on but far side. It, we've seen region 36, 14, and 15. These were the big X flare players and solar storm producers that are now rotating back into Earth view. Region 36, 14 has yet to completely come into view, but it sure looks like some stuff is going on there. Plus, we have a few other regions as well that were flare active. In fact, as we pull up the JSOC HMI helioseismology far sided monitor, you can see these regions as they were rotating through the 
the sun's front side. As they go into the gold area, that is the sun's far side. And you start looking for big dark regions. So region 3621 even has given us a little bit of activity. But look how big region 3615 and 14 remained. But they're not the only ones. Region 3619 and 22 are also surviving their far side passage. So as these regions begin to rotate back into Earth view, not only are we going to get a lot of activity uh, along with big radio blackouts from regions from these two regions returning into view, but region 3619 and 22 will as well. So we will have easily two weeks, if not more than that, of boosted X-ray flux big solar flares, as well as the potential for big solar storms before we get to yet another kind of dead zone in the sun. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders expect a lot of noise on the bands over the next two to possibly three weeks before things calm down. And aurora photographers, well, we may have more chances for solar storms coming up very soon. Now, switching to our moon, we are coming out of the new moon and passing through the first quarter phase. And by the 18th, our moon will be about 75% illuminated. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, like, I don't know, maybe some aurora, well, you're going to have this companion to deal with. So you're going to need to check your local rise and set times. Now, switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating that one-two punch from those two solar storms that are on their way to Earth. At high latitudes, NOAA is expecting minor storm conditions with up to about a 65% chance of a major storm. And I'm going to extend that in through the 15th because likely the this, this second solar storm in particular is going to be a bit on the late side. So aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you could definitely get a decent show and it may even continue into the 16th before things begin to calm down. Now at mid latitudes, well, we are still expecting at least active conditions from these solar storms, but we do have up to a 30 or 35 percent chance of a minor storm. And this again could be around the 15th when things begin to peak, but it things should also settle down quite quickly because about about the 16th into the 17th, it should be pretty quiet at mid latitudes because we're not expecting the biggest punches from these particular solar storms. So war photographers, if you're at mid latitudes, be sure to catch the storms early and be on it because they won't last for all that long. Now, switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we are sitting well in the triple digits this week, and the numbers could rise. We could be easily into the 160s, possibly the 170s by the end of the week. And this is because of all of those active regions that are now rotating into Earth view. We are sitting at moderate noise level on the bands, on the dayside radio bands. NOAA is giving us about a 35% chance of M class flares at the R1 to R2 level radio blackout, and even a 5% chance of X class flares at an R3 level radio blackout. And this will continue easily throughout this week. And again, the numbers, the risks may rise as we move into next week, depending upon how those new active regions look as they rotate into view. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders expect your radio blackouts to be on the menu this week and next week before things begin to settle down. So you're just going to have to kind of grin and bear it. Now, switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week, everything is in the green when it comes to big radiation storms. We're sitting at the D1 normal range, and this is for you aviators at flight level 360, which is also the S0 quiet range for everyone else. And NOAA's giving us only about a 1% chance of a radiation storm at an S1 to S2 level easily over the next few days. We might see that risk rise just a little bit as we move into the end of this week, and that's because we have a couple regions that are going to be rotating to the west limb that might give us a little bit of a chance of radiation storms. But for the most part, everything will remain nice and calm. So you frequent flyers, and this does include air crew and you high-risk passengers, you need to stay vigilant. But for right now, everything looks good. So the space weather this week is getting very exciting. We have that one-two punch from those two solar storms that are on their way to Earth. So aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you could definitely get a show. And even aurora photographers at mid latitudes could get a show, but you're going to need to stay on your toes because it may not last all that long. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, 
Well, this isn't eclipse week and the sun is done with being quiet. So it's getting noisy again and you're going to have to deal with a lot more noise on the bands. And radio blackouts are also at play this week and possibly in through next week. We could even get R2 and possibly R3 level radio blackouts if the regions that are rotating into Earth view are as noisy as they were the last time around. So just kind of grin and bear it over this next week or possibly two weeks before things settle down. And now you GPS users, well, you know, we do have those solar storms that are on their way to Earth, and when they hit, that could cause GPS reception issues on, the, on Earth's night side, especially anywhere near Aurora. And then we also have radio blackouts picking up again, so we might have GPS reception issues on Earth's day side as well. So you're going to have to just need to get through the next few days before things settle down a little bit, and always be careful near dawn and near dusk because that's when GPS reception is always a bit dicey anyway. And if you're a drone pilot or UAV flyer, be sure when the solar storm hits to calibrate your magnetometers often. I'm Tamitha the Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching. Okay. Thank you, uh, Timotha. And... Uh... <laughs> A fairly, uh, a fairly detailed report there for sure. Uh, most interesting indeed. So uh, things are definitely afoot. Thank you for the various reports coming in on the audio levels, uh, Mr. Steve, as well. I uh, very quickly uh, uh, checked the, the YouTube side of things, and um, uh, I think that uh, I think it was all right. It started out a bit uh, too much. Um, just got to get my levels right. I haven't really had this problem before with uh, the levels being all over the place, but um, uh, maybe I shouldn't have come downstairs. <laughs> I should have left everything upstairs. Um, anyway, there it is. Uh, thanks, uh, Timotha, and uh, uh, all very good. Now, um, let's just jump into spaceweather.com, and uh, let me see where are we here. Um, space weather okay according to the current space weather uh, solar wind is 422.3 kilometers a second at a density of 9.10 protons per cubic centimeter the current disk of the sun uh, looks a bit like this and there's several um, sunspots on, on this uh, disk, quite a few. It's very, very busy at the moment. In fact, the sunspot number has gone up to 247. And the radio sun measured at a wavelength, wow, I've never seen it this high. Um, <clears throat> the radio sun measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimeters is 227 solar flux units. Boy, isn't that peaking? I've never seen the uh, the solar flux units uh, in into the two hundreds, two hundred and twenty-seven. Goodness me! Um, geomagnetic storm watch cancelled. Uh, a CME expected to hit Earth on April eighteenth, which I think uh, Timothy was alluding to, uh, did not arrive on time. Uh, either it is moving more slowly than expected or it missed. Either way, a geomagnetic storm is now unlikely, uh, which um, uh, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the watch is cancelled as far as the aurora is concerned. Um, but interestingly enough, if you look at uh, our current image of the uh, aurora australis um, over the Antarctica, this is what it looks like at the moment. So <clears throat> there's quite a, a reasonable ring uh, of auroral activity over Antarctica, which is now arching its way towards the mainland. And there's a bit of yellow in that as well. So um, there's definitely uh, some high altitude uh, auroral activity going on for sure. Um, it's quite uh, quite strong. So uh, there's definitely something happening. Um, and... Uh, uh, there's a, a reference to a comet here too. Um, comet 12P Pons Brooks uh, will make its closest approach to the sun at 0.78 AU. Uh, and the NASA's Stereo A spacecraft is monitoring the Devil Comet's progress. We've got an image of this uh, to show. Um, here it is, and it should play. I've got that on a loop. So... Um, yeah, this is an interesting view. 
And this is this is taken from Stereo, Stereo A's uh, spacecraft, which is monitoring the the space the, the uh, comet. Uh, on April 12, it captured 12p passing by Jupiter, just as a CME billowed out from the sun. So the bright object in the uh, to the left is Jupiter, with the comet uh, moving its way around, and of course all that uh, um, um, material is streaming away from the sun there, a, a, a coronal max, mass ejection. Uh, uh, they also say he, that uh, the kink in the comet's tail, you can see that there's a kink in the comet's tail. <laughs> um, this is a disconnection event caused by a, a CME impact of a sharp gust of solar wind. The, uh, the full movie shows the kink rip, ripping rippling away from the comet's core. Uh, they say here, stay tuned for new movies as 12P uh, nears its perithelion on April 21st. Uh, Stereo A's heliospheric imager may capture additional examples of the comet's tail responding to solar activity at a point blank, at point blank, blank range. Um, and we have a, a close-up image of the uh, comet itself. Um, did I? Yes, I did. There it is, coming up. So that's the close-up image of the comet. Nice-looking uh, comet. And, um, yeah, so, um, uh, well, uh, uh, this, uh, the, the comet was very low, uh, only about 10 degrees above the horizon in this image. Um, after sunset, the gas tail has a magnificent kink and many fine structures. Um, and uh, then they say, look at the killer parabolic shape of the comet, the coma, the coma. Yeah, so most fascinating indeed. I hope to be able to photograph uh, comets like that in the, in the near future with the, uh, the telescope when it finally gets uh, sorted out. Um, all right, I think that's about all I shall uh, bring up there, I think. The latest asteroid count hasn't changed much from last week. Uh, as of uh, April 19, 2024, there are 2,394 uh, potentially hazardous comets, uh, asteroids, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, dearie me. Okay, I think that's about all I have at six minutes past the hour and if I oh there it is um, I can just get my notepad here uh, I shall take a quick call or a quick count of who there is that wants to check in and uh, let's hope this goes okay all right uh, this is VK3 EKH listening on 3541 for any stations wishing to check in Okay, VK3GL, VK3JR, VK3TJS, VK3GOD, and VK3SBX. Anybody else? Okay, across to you there, Mr. Lewis, VK3 Golf Lima, VK3 EKH.
Yeah, thanks, Graham. VK3 GL, VK3 EKH returning. Thanks for the uh, extensive report, and uh, I'm glad that the um, the signal is being heard reasonably well down at uh, at Bem River. Uh, so uh, all very good. And uh, no, it's 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 um, yeah. It, no, the the audio from the from Timothy is spot on. Uh, it's just. Uh, to go from my on-air level to uh, the video, um, normally the levels are about the same and I don't have much fiddling to do, but for some, some reason I've, I've got levels not quite right when I, go, when I cut to the video uh, off the, the computer to, uh, to on-air. I've got to knock my faders right down. Uh, I've got to do it quickly. Whereas um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's shocking. Um, but it's this. Uh, it's just annoying. I've got to work out what's going on here um, with uh, everything. I mean, I've got so many issues with the audios here. It's just audios with audio um, because I'm trying to get my uh, my audio level correct for my AM transmissions on 160, and uh, in making sure that's all set up right, uh, you know, it's affecting what I do here on Friday night broadcast. So. Um, it's annoying. So uh, yes, I've got to try and get the uh, the level from the computer uh, from vMix to uh, to on, on air at the right level, and, and then I've got to watch what's going over YouTube. So uh, normally I have a couple of monitors that I have for watching my email and and YouTube separately, and I just haven't set that up at this stage. So I'm watching myself on on YouTube right now on the on the laptop. And uh, it's, uh, image is looking quite good, actually. Um, <laughs> that's just not me. It's the overall image. Um, and then I had the repeater drop out on me, RTV. But I, I, I believe I've been there all the way along tonight, but it's just the, uh, for some reason, the signal uh, off the repeater here has decided to uh, become weak. So uh, uh, it's just a problem at this end. But that's another story. Anyway, thanks, uh uh, Graham and um, yeah, look. I, if I am around afterwards, uh, I'll, uh, it'll only be for a short while because um, uh, yeah, I'm a bit uh, a bit tired. Um, all right, uh, thanks, Gray. Uh, across to Frank VK3JR VK3EKH. Oh, so quick. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks, Gray. Uh, yeah, look, I Uh, yes, and, uh, amazing. It's happening on the sun and uh, consequently uh, geomagnetically. Uh, so uh, it's it's about it's the second highest sunspot uh, uh, 
I think it might have been mobile phone. Yep, all right. Yeah, no worries, Frank. <laughs> VK3JR, VK3EKH. Not a problem, uh, Frank. Uh, thanks for the report. And uh, yeah, I, I concur. Uh, the the sunspot number is quite uh, quite high. I've never seen it that high. Even I, I, I forgot to mention the KP index, but um, the planetary K index is also uh, on the high side. It's uh, currently at 4.33, a KP of 4.33, and it's considered unsettled. And the 24-hour max is the same, uh, 4.33 unsettled. It's usually a little bit lower than that. Uh, but yeah, um, but the, the, certainly the radio sun, um, solar flux uh, is 227. It's amazing, Grace. Uh, okay, uh, thanks, Frank. Um, across to Jack, VK3TJS and Shepard and VK3EKH. Yeah, thank you, please. Uh, VK3EKH, I'm the group to VK3TJS. Good evening to you, and good evening to everyone that's joined the uh, broadcast. And quite interesting and yeah, consistently good about 20, 25 overnight, so uh, you had no problem tonight. And um, I think I mentioned last uh, last time I think Graham was uh, kind of competing with you with the signal strength. He had a tremendous signal strength from uh, from his portable location, so it was good. And um, yeah, thanks for uh, you know uh, doing the broadcast and uh, keeping us informed on what's going on. And, um, it's quite, uh, quite interesting. Uh, so, I hope you have a good weekend uh, and uh, enjoy it and have a good rest. And uh, thank you to everyone else and please see uh, VK3 EKH. This is VK3 TJS in Shepparton. Thanks, Jack. VK3 TJS, VK3 EKH. Thanks for uh, the kind words and um, uh, we try to please. 